so it's really um yeah it's really great to to be here and really excited to be having this conversation and i think that um i have learned so much from other people who have gone before me and so i hope that some of the things that i'll i'll, I'll share here will be really valuable to um, those who are aspiring to senior leadership so my um uh, presentation is all about line management meetings as we call them in education and um, line management meetings isn't a hugely common term actually outside of education it's used uh, in some like industries but the, the terms that are often used are one-to-one -one meetings or check-ins um, so it's actually interesting that I think that we have a um, it's really common in education and it probably says something about the kind of philosophy around what these meetings look like in education versus um, other industries. So whatever it is that you call them, um, essentially I'm talking about the times when you meet with your direct reports um, and you have conversations with them like probably weekly or it might be fortnightly and you talk about the sorts of things that are going on um, for them and certain elements of their leadership. So before um, I get started, um, I think it's um, just useful for me to give you a flavour of um, my leadership journey and where I'm coming from um, on this. And um, I am, I always show this slide and it always makes me laugh um, because this was a post on the SLT Newbie um, account a few months ago. And uh, it's a parody account, so if you don't follow it, I mean, I don't follow it, but I, it came up on, on my Twitter feed. Uh, and essentially, it is uh, attempting to mock um, those of us who are uh, perceived to be quite young in leadership and have kind of come through really, really quickly and progressed to these uh, positions of leadership with some speed. And uh, I've just got my journey here um, to demonstrate um, the similarities between this parody uh, post and my journey. So I, um, uh, I've been wanted to be a, a teacher probably since secondary school. Um, I left secondary school um, and went to Durham University and did a um, degree in biological anthropology. Uh, loved my three years there, and then came back and did a master's at Imperial College. Um, at that point, I decided I wasn't going to go into teaching and that I was going to become a, a researcher. Spent a year um, as a research assistant and um, found that it was just lots of paperwork. I didn't enjoy it very much. So I then went back and said, actually, teaching is all I've ever wanted to do. So I don't know why I've delayed this process and uh, joined to Teach First. Um, I worked in a school in Camden for two years and then uh, joined uh, a new start school as a head of science. Um, and that's the school that I'm still at now. Uh, I became, did that job for two years, did a stint as head of maths for a bit, and then became an assistant principal and now um, vice principal. And during that time, I have spent a lot of time being sat in front of, well, uh, in front of leaders in some sort of course. So from the MPQSL to various ad hoc CPD sessions to a master's in leadership, um, I have spent a lot of time trying to make sure that I have the knowledge base around leadership. Um, I think particularly because I was acutely aware that I was like inexperienced or young and as a result I needed to kind of overcompensate for that. So I've spent a lot of time um, sat there um, listening to people talk about leadership and also a lot of time reading about leadership as well. So um, hopefully what I'll share with you today is just some insights um, around line management in particular um, have been working in a small school means that I actually line manage quite a lot of people and I've been thrown into um, line managing um, like departments where I have no knowledge of their subject so line managing, a, line managing a head of history or a head of geography where I have zero expertise and I'm trying to bring the best out of those people um, when I have little understanding of, of their subject. So hopefully um, what I will share with you today will be useful um, for you. Um, so I will get into it. Essentially, many of these ideas are not my own. Um, I am an avid reader, very much like, like Ben, um, and I have found reading outside of education to be one of the most powerful mechanisms and drivers in my leadership journey. So I'm going to walk you through um, this book, Nine Lies About Work. Um, if you haven't read it, I can't recommend this book enough. Um, it will challenge uh, your thinking. It has kind of nine, essentially nine lies. Pretty, you'll probably agree with all of the nine lies, or those will be things that you have embodied and embraced. And you'll be shocked by how they unpack research and ideas um, 
and it will make you think really critically about it. So I, um, I've got lots of screenshots from the book. Uh, and I'm literally going to talk you through the book for a bit and then um, pick up on some of the key points that I've taken from it as a result. So um, they, at the end of the book, they talk about the idea of leadership being a lie. And I really like um, that. Uh, ben, sorry, I've gone too far. Uh, that Ben spoke about this already, but um, the difference, I think, the common thing about leaders is they have a group of followers, and so we should probably spend as much time thinking about the followers as we do the leadership itself, because um, it's about having a group of people that you can bring on this journey, and they have to be, they have to think you're cred credible and know what you're talking about. They need to believe in your vision. They need to be aligned to your values, and they need to be able to be committed and also trust you in taking them on that journey. And so I think that um, the book makes this point about us almost getting rid of leadership styles and all those other kind of. Um, concepts that we've developed around leadership and focusing just on followers because actually there's probably some commonalities um, that we can quite easily identify around followers rather than thinking about leadership on it on its own um, they then go on to talk about um, uh, like elements of um, leadership in particular and I'm just gonna um, hopefully this isn't patronizing but I'm gonna read through um, some extracts from the book so this one says this is a true lesson in leading from the real world a leader is someone who has followers plain and simple the only determinant of whether anyone is leading is whether someone else is following this might seem like an obvious statement until we recall how easily we overlook its implications. Followers, their needs, their feelings, their fears and hopes are strangely absent when we speak of leaders as exemplars of strategy, execution, vision, oratory, relationships, charisma and so on. Um, and for me, this point was really, really important because those things at the bottom of strategy, execution and vision are all things that I've heard people talk to me about a lot in the various leadership courses. They're also things that I've talked about in interview in trying to convince a panel that I should should get the job. So I was really um, taken aback, actually, by this thinking that that I don't often think about their needs, or their feelings and their fears and their hopes and how important that might be. It then goes on to say the idea of leadership is missing the idea of followers. It is missing the idea that our subject here is at heart a question of particularly human relationship. Namely, why would anyone choose to devote his or her energies to and to take risks on behalf of someone else? And what we're asking people who follow us to do is huge. We're asking them to operate and to um, do things um, and to have trust that what we're asking them to do is the right thing to do. And actually, I don't, I don't think I've ever spent enough time thinking about this. And so um, it then goes on um, to talk about um, essentially what a group of followers are looking for. So broadly speaking, we want to feel part of something bigger than ourselves, the best of we, while at the same time feeling that our leader knows and values us for who uh, we are as, as a unique individual, the best of me. Um, more specifically, we follow leaders. Sorry, I'm just going to move that way. Uh, we follow leaders who who connect us to a mission we believe in, who clarify what's expected of us, who surround us with people who define excellence the same way we do, who value us for our strengths, who show us that our teammates will always be there for us, who diligently replay our winning plays, who challenge us to keep getting better, and who give us confidence in the future. And like. How inspiring is that? Like I, that, that, that's, that's what I want to feel, being led by someone. Um, and I think that if we're thinking about our leadership in that way, I think it will challenge us to think really critically about how we do what we do to ensure that the people that we lead and the people who follow us feel that they're set up to be successful. And then it goes on to say, this is not a list of qualities in leaders, but rather a set of feelings in followers. And we say to ourselves that leadership is indeed a thing because we know it when we see it, we're not really seeing a defi uh, any definable characteristic of another human. What we are seeing is in fact our own feelings as a follower. 
Uh, and that is something that I think is actually really critical to line management in particular and these opportunities that we have to meet with those who report to us on a weekly or fortnight, fortnightly basis. So my question is, how do you build these feelings? How do you galvanize a team of followers? And I do think the answer is in these meetings. It's in whatever you call them, line management, support and challenge, one-to-ones, check-in, check-ins, whatever it is, it's, it happens in these moments. It doesn't happen when um, the head teacher stands up in front of briefing and, and says an inspiring message once per week or in set day. It happens in those regular um, opportunities to meet with someone on a weekly basis and on a personal level. So um, the book then tends to go on to uh, thinking about these, this concept of uh, weekly check-ins. And I won't spend um, too much time kind of reading through this, but essentially their point is that um, the quality doesn't matter as much as the frequency. So um, looking at the research out there about people's engagement to an organisation is very much about frequency over the quality of what happens in there. And that's actually a bit reassuring to think that actually um, I, I can strive to try and make them as powerful as, as they can be, but what I should be committed to is the frequency of it and that the quality, whilst I can strive for it, um, like it probably doesn't matter as much. Uh, and they talk about um, in these weekly check-ins, um, talk, they talk about having two kind of key questions, like asking the person what their priorities are and essentially how you can help. And it's a really, really simple way to think about what should happen in that meeting. And those two powerful questions, I'm sure, will drive a lot of discussion opportunities uh, for input. And they then go on to talk about actually it doesn't need to be very long and sometimes 10 to 15 minutes is enough time to have um, to, to, to reap the benefits of these weekly um, uh, check-ins. Um, they also talk about this concept of coaching and how um, for many kind of HR people they talk about all these skills that you need to make these weekly check-ins really powerful and they simplify it and say that it probably doesn't actually need that much. Um, they then uh, uh, go on here to talk about um, the importance of it and, and the way that the data has shown uh, that essentially when these check-ins happen, engagement and performance levels increase and you reduce retention. So when we're thinking about the issues that we have in education at the moment around retention, actually this could be a really, really powerful lever if we get it right to keep people um, in the organisation. There's a quite a useful article in, in the Harvard Business Review, which um, goes on to talk about this, this concept of one-to-one -one, um, meetings. And again, I think there are some really, really useful quotes um, in this piece. So they talk about the kind of challenge of the one-to-one -one meeting, online management meeting, being about developing the person, but also about having uh, an idea or having the organizational mandate in the background. So you still have a sense of what the bigger picture is when you're having these one-to-one -one conversations with um, individuals in the organization. So what can we take away from um, all of these elements? Um, I think we can take away a re the fact that it's really important. So meeting with people regularly is important. Um, there is the point, of course, about the frequency of it and how that tends to be more important than the quality. Um, and also that it's about developing a person whilst maintaining a sense of the wider picture. And I think that those are probably three important uh, takeaways from some of this um, thinking. I think then that this has um, implications for what we do. So here are some top tips. Block out regular times and avoid cancelling meetings. Um, I definitely sometimes struggle with this, uh, managing my calendar, but I think it's really important that you, you avoid cancelling these meetings, or if you're in a position where you do have to cancel them, that you're doing it well, it well in advance. I think it means a lot for people to have that time with you on a, on a weekly or fortnightly basis. Prepare discussion points and collaborate on, a, on an agenda. I think um, people don't want to feel done to, they want to feel like it's a collaborative process. So having an open dialogue about what you should be talking about is key. Being fully present and listening. Um, uh, we've already heard about the importance of listening already from, from Ben, but here is a particular opportunity where it is really, really critical that, that you are listening, that you're fully in the room and not distracted by emails or, or a child you know, jumping into um, a conversation or someone knocking on the door. Start positive. Um, it's a really um, 
great opportunity to show people that you that you value them and so like you use it as a chance to talk about what they've been doing really well problem solve like be practical try and do things in line management so that people don't leave the meeting with more things to do and feeling like you've just increased their workload but rather that they can come to that conversation and that they can um, solve a problem and be curious and ask questions um, because that will help people arrive um, at a solution um, that is appropriate. Ask questions about their career plans. Like this is very much about developing people themselves. So um, do ask those questions, but also be willing to share things. I know that I line manage people who are looking uh, to become senior leaders. And so sometimes I will share some of the challenges that I've experienced that week. And it just gives them a sense of, insight into what it's like to be a senior leader which is also about them and their development and their career plans express gratitude which i've mentioned already um do some deliberate practice like work out do some stuff together so if if they're going to have a difficult conversation with someone in their department or uh, someone that they are responsible for like talk it through there and then like ensure that they leave that conversation feeling really confident to go into it um, like sometimes it's really hard to be put in those situations and so having a chance to practice with someone else is useful avoid um, adding too much to to-do lists i think this is really important and sometimes there is a danger of line management meetings just falling into a, a tick list of like these are all the things you need to do like now tell me that you've done them so we can tick them off so avoid uh, avoid that process and then finally don't ignore the emotional side of leadership like leadership is tough it's hard going what we do is um difficult working with young people sometimes in very challenging circumstances is hard and teaching can take its emotional toll so um don't like feel don't be afraid to engage in that with people because i think sometimes we can put parameters around what people should be sharing um and it's not conducive to their success and it's not conducive to having a really positive and supportive culture in your school and the final thing is don't try uh, try not to do too much it's really easy to overload line management with all of these things and think you're you're going to do wonders with people in like a 40 minute or half an hour slot a week um, so try to be really realistic about what you can cover um, so I've talked about all these things and the examples that I've used are very much from industry not from um, education so um, I have I guess some questions and some queries about things that are specific to education and to schools which i think would be worth discussing in uh, breakout rooms so where does accountability fit into this you know if, if we are now going to be all about the person and their development and going to do this kind of collaborative work on um their agenda like where does accountability fit where does communi communicating key messages fit into this sometimes you're passing down information you've had a senior leadership team meeting and you know, this is an action that everyone's going to do and you're passing that information down. Where does quality assurance fit in? You know, a big part of being a, um, a middle or a senior leader is just checking the quality of what's going on and providing feedback on that and how do you situate that in, in this um, structure. And the final one really is about moving whole school priorities forward. Like how do you, how do, you do that effectively? whilst also making those meetings about, about that person, about them, about their development, when you also have that bigger picture in mind and you have a responsibility to help drive those priorities forward. So um, those are just uh, four key things. I don't think I have answers on them, but it would be useful, I think, to have a conversation about that in breakout rooms. And then my final thing, just to share, because I think this quote is really important, um, is that sometimes, um, like, we think that by communicating or saying something that it's been done and it's kind of done and dusted and so there is a really it's really important that we kind of as leaders in some of these one-to-one -one meetings make sure that people understand what we have said and that the communication is going both ways and there aren't any misunderstandings so it's always a good idea to say you know what i'm hearing you say is x and giving people an opportunity to then be able to um, like echo back what it is or correct you if it's misunderstood. And um, so I, I think that this quote is, is really, really important. And that is all for me.